Dawson over there visiting one day. I said, well, are you going to sell sold out by the sack or something like that over here? Oh, no, they wasn't going to sell it only by the truckload. I said, well, now then, look, we've been buying our salt here forever. And I said, if you're not going to sell salt, well, I'm going right across the river because that's my land. Half of that river is mine and half of it's yours. Now, you're developing your half. I said, well, when you get yours all developed, then I'll go over and tap yours, and I'll have the same thing on me. And, uh, well, hell, you see, I own half that Cimarron River through there, and they own half of it. And by gosh, if they won't let me have salt for my cattle, I'll take my bulldozer down there and pile me up a bunch of salt. I won't have all the expenses that they've got in it. But man, they've had a lot of fun over that. Yeah. I said, Cargill and Selma said, maybe we better be partners. I said, well, might be. But anyhow, all of that, that old country down in there is pretty rough. Boggy. How come all any reason why all that salt is in the river in there? What? Well, you from? know, I asked the Army engineers. They, you know, they had a plan that they were going to change the flow of that water, going to take fresh water and go around that salt deposit. You want to spend billions of dollars. I know I met with Henry Bellman and one of the men from the Bureau of Money and Management, what is it? Anyhow, he was out here with them. We was in some helicopter and we met over on them old bluffs. That thing is coming up the river more all the time than it used to be. It used to be on the Buffalo side, see the the buffalo comes down over here, and the Cimarron comes down here, and they come together. Well, I own this where it comes down here and comes together. Well, it's about 12 miles from there back toward Selman up there. I go within about a mile and a half of Selman up there, put them down there. And uh, the uh, salt is going up the river. Well, they decided that they're going to dam it. Up there on me, and there's just going to like 12 feet of cutting my ranch in two up right through the middle of the Clay Creek. Well, I didn't want it, of course. And, but they were going to dam it, and they were going to send the fresh water across the summer on and go up there and go on down with it. In other words, go around all this salt. Well, they paid me a lot of money for the privilege of core drilling, testing for the dam side. And uh, General Morris, start out with, he was just a colonel over here at Tulsa. And the time went on, and he developed, he became, at one time, he was the president or the head of the Army Engineers at uh, West Point. In other words, he was the head instructor. And then he became the top man with the Corps of Engineers and became general. And uh, he told me that this thing, there was no way that they could build a dam because it hadn't anything to put a dam on. Because you get down so many feet and that there, it was nothing but salt all the way up to maybe 6,000 feet deep. Well, the water goes in under the ground and goes on down and comes up down there by Tulsa. They claim that that was 90, I believe it's 96 carloads of salt goes down that Cimarron River every day. So, that salt, if it's not used or evaporates, well, it goes into the big lakes down there by Tulsa. And they were trying to clean them up, you know, keep salt out of them. But there's no way that they could do it. Henry Bellman, 
he wanted it. He thought it was going to help his country down there with his irrigation. Get the salt out of the water and then they could irrigate down there. But what, what is down? Billings. Billings, yeah. I asked him about that one time at one of his meetings. And, you know, he couldn't explain that very good. <laughs> <laughs> not to suit not them ranchers anyhow. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. But it's a, cattle business has been a very good business. A lot of people say it's bad and it's in a bad shape now. But I don't see it that way. I think mismanagement to a great extent, and people aren't like they used to be. It used to be if you had a neighbor, you helped him. Now then, they don't take time to help their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And just like these banks, they loan these cow people, cow, cattlemen money. They want their land and added security. They wanted all the cattle their equipment and everything. Well, the equipment has been a wonderful thing for all of us, for all people. But on the other hand, the equipment has caused a lot of our problems. All right, now then, a farm tractor. Hell, I remember when $1,500 was by the big old International McCormick gang tractor or a M and M mold lane or something like that. And it'd be a team. But I remember when we used to hitch that team up in the morning and work them all day and come back and fed them and clean them up at night. Take them again the next morning. Now we didn't get many acres in a day, but we'd spend enough days and had enough teams and enough plows you get it done. Now then they can go out here now and plow in one day with one piece of equipment. They can plow more than a, say 10. Farmers could do it all day or in a week even. Because in, mm -hmm. did you use horses and whenever, mules? Whenever you go in and I got a little old two bottom plow and six set of mules on it. And that night when you get out there, you can take, go back and take a running start and jump from across where you had plowed all day. And now then, they, they got one plow that did one round and farther than I can jump by a long ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. What kind of wagons you have on the ranch? What brand? Oh, it was Springfield. Very good wagon? Well, as far as I can remember, I would say that Springfield wagon was about the only wagon that was in this area. I don't remember Springfield and what else. I don't remember another wagon. Springfield was How much did a new Springfield cost? I think the father gave forty-two or three dollars for one one. And what did that include? What was standard equipment on yeah. a wagon? What Tongue, was? neck yoke, double trees, single trees, brake. So I said, I'm about it. Iron, iron tires. How that was it? that was a small wagon. Did that include the wagon sheet and the bowls? Well, no, they, they didn't. Uh, the bows and the seat were not standard equipment, as I remember. They, uh, they were the luxury things. Just, you know, just got a spring seat. Why, wow, that was wonderful. A lot of people just either stood up or had a plank laid across there, and you sat on that plank. Oh, it got hard. <laughs> You mentioned freight, a freight wagon up to Fort Supply. Those wagons, 
they were strictly a big hole. Just like you right now, they've got these, you got a pickup or you got a great big semi. Well, they were the semis of those days. How big were those wagons? Oh, they were a little wider than the average wagon. The wheels were quite a little taller, and the tires would be, if I remember right, were nine inches wide. Iron? Hmm? Iron tires? Oh, yes. Yeah. How many horses would you use on that one? Well, not less than 12. And how did you hitch them? Well, you, sometimes when you start out from down there, they took four and four and four. And sometimes if they say, oh, you get a sore neck mule or something like that, you might drop one pair off and then you'd have just two leaders to point to. Mm -hmm. But then... What would you haul in those wagons normally? Oh, you'd haul about three tons. If your ground was hard, you'd haul four. But where we was holding there, it was uh, going north, it was uphill and sandy. Coming back the other way, it was hard. And coming back would still be uphill. You get up for, for an old red house country, was, uh, that was the ridge. And it went down that way clear to the Cimarron River. By the way, it went downhill then to the, uh, well, there's a beaver then. Because, you see, the Canadian doesn't make up until the beaver and Wolf Creek come together. And where they come together out here, why, well, that's where the uh, North Canadian starts. Where were you freighting from? Supply. Supply. Yeah, that railroad. And to start with, before that, see, they had the railroad down here at, at uh, Tangier, Santa Fe. And they would try to start out with it all from the Santa Fe. Then the Katy went through up there. And uh, it would take them change over at Woodward and, and uh, all to get off Santa Fe at Woodward, and then they'd go on up there. Because, you see, there wasn't. Oh, uh, broom corn and wheat were about some of the things that went on Katy. Because Katy went to the Gulf. So that's where they take the wheat. But the cattle and such as that went to Kansas City. So that's there. And then all of the big, as a rule, the big wholesale houses. We're on the Santa Fe. Now you were freighting from Fort Supply to the ranch? Yes. And that what was before the railroad yeah. came in. And what goods were you freighting? Hmm? What goods would you freight on those wagons? Oh, we'd all oil cake. And then we would be all in uh, commodities like sugar, flour, things like that. Then the farmer the people around us, the neighbors, they'd come in and pick it up from there. And then when we'd go, we'd haul up or load it, then we'd start back, we'd be empty. Well, then he would go by the neighbors up there and pick up a wagon load of wheat and haul it to town for them. And a lot of times when, I don't know, one year, in the, they said the year I was born, 1912, they had an awful snowstorm. A lot of cattle died. And they said that father had his Old big wagons, and he was hauling, trying to get cake home. And the neighbors with littler wagons and smaller teams would meet his wagon, take the cake off that wagon, and go feed his cattle for him. In other words, that was a place where being a neighbor paid off. Yeah, I've heard about that winter of 1911 or 12. That was a bad winter. Yeah. Um, how long? Now, where, where was the ranch headquarters, the Selman Ranch? Oh, the old headquarters from Lovedale would have been 
about two and a half miles west, right up the railroad track. And now where is Lovedale, the old town site? Right, about a half a mile west of my headquarters. Mm -hmm. My headquarters, Lovedale is uh, from Highway 34 on where it crosses the old railroad track there, would be about a mile. Then about two and a half miles on the west. See, when the railroad comes through there, they gave J.O. a switch of his own up there, and the stockyards of his own. And uh, that's where our, then our cake was hauled up there by rail. And my father built him a big old warehouse right next to the railroad track down low. And boy, he had him a tin slide made, and he'd put that slide up in the car slide the cake and stuff down that, slide it down into that warehouse. And then stack that cake 20 stacks high, and they were 100 pound sacks, they weren't 50 pound sacks, like we got now. They were 100 pounds. I tell you what, mm, I've had a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of uh, house did your father build for the headquarters? It was a wood house and had them little Oh, I don't know what to call them, but then uh, it was a, see, there was a kitchen, a pantry, dining room, and the room was called a phone room, but then it was another dining room, one, two, three bedrooms, and living room, pretty good side down. Well, there's a picture of it right there. Now, what kind of headquarters did you build? Oh, I built a lot different. A lot more modern. See, up there, there wasn't, the only water we had up there was cistern water. And that's all I had for a long time, but then we've got real water now. And I've got, see, there's one. Whenever they opened this land for settlement, did your father buy any of the homesteaders out? Did he buy their homesteads? Or? Oh, yes, lots of them. A lot of them, they'd come by there, they'd be have their wagons and everything loaded. They'd come by the headquarters and they'd sell jail little patents for whatever money he might have. If, he, if he'd give them $20 for it and he had $20, he paid them. Didn't he? Give them a note and they'd take them by some merchants on the way out. And they the merchant would pay them and then father would repay them. Mm -hmm. And that's the way they did he pretty well, of that land. Did he keep the whole ranch intact pretty well? Oh, yes, yeah. He put it together. And, well, back in them days, as you know, if you had 35, 40 men working for you, why, well, some of them you could trust and you'd go and put them on a homestead over there on some water or something, you know, and then when they, they'd work for you all the time, they'd home prove it up. When they get it proved up, then they'd sell you their land. And uh, once in a while, you'd find some old boy that decided he wanted to keep it, but then not very often. They didn't keep it very long. How many acres did your father have? He had deeded and leased. One time he had 163,000. How many do you have? Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What a difference. Yeah. Yeah, my father had a ranch started. He started at uh, Glacier, Texas, down there on the South Canadian, went to Belvedere, Kansas. And then he had a little outfit up in Mulvane, Kansas. Had land over here at Winoka, Quinlan. Right out north down here. Had 30,000 acres up over the supply dam. And that's the path. A lot of country. We start branding cattle in the spring and brand them all in the summer. 
How many men did it take to brand cattle? Well, back when we was doing it then, we didn't have these cradles and we didn't have trail shoots like we've got now. We just go and gather a pasture out of whatever was in that pasture, unless it was too big. Father believed in big pasture. We might have a pasture that have 15,000 acres in it bigger than a lot of people's ranches anymore. But he liked big pastures. And we just go out there and gather a bunch of them down there on the flat, and the cowboys around them holding them with the horses, you know, and just keep them turned in. And then maybe a couple of three boys are going in there roping them, dragging the calves out, flanking them and throwing them and branding them right there on the prairie. Now then, you've got to have trails squeeze shoots and all the nice modern things. Back then it would work. Now then they drink beer and they play and have fun. That's just about it. I never get so mm. Mm. my father didn't teach me to work cattle that way. Did you and your father do any work to support World War One? No. I had this ranch up here, and I liked, I got to be 36 just three days before my number was up on the draft. <coughs> when I became 36 and, that, and you were married, and you were in agriculture, you were automatically deferred. Did you have any contracts with the government then to supply beef for the army? or? Well, we did some, not a great deal. We did it at that time I had some bulldozers and they insisted that I take those bulldozers and put them on government jobs rather than work on building terraces and dams and so forth. What about Father C was on the final appeal board for the state of Oklahoma. He and oh, uh, Joe Champlin, Command Chaplain up at Enid. and General Hershey were on the final field board. Um, what about the CCC program or WPA? Did they do any work on your ranch? So, what they do? Well, they built some uh, dams and little diversions. They were soil conservation. And WPA, of course, they were just building roads, culverts, and such as that. Mm -hmm. And uh, see, they had the CC camp out here at uh, Boiling Springs. I know they had an all, they had that big snowstorm, what, 47, was it? They had an awful time. They was running out of food. So they finally bought a bulldozer and came down to, well, I was living right out here then. And I uh, wanted to know how to get across there. I said, well, I said, if you get here at daylight in the morning, I'll go on horseback and you can follow me with this big equipment. So I took them through the pasture and took them around through the range and got them over to the east, uh, north and south highway right out north town here. Well, it was really the north and south highways were pretty well open or where they could get through. But hell, they had three or four hundred men with them and trucks and big six-wheel drivers, you know. But they went to Woodward to get groceries. They was out of there they could eat. And they couldn't get down the highway from the there at all. Mm -hmm. How did the depression, the dust storms affect the ranch? Well, there are dust storms. The children nowadays and the younger people that weren't here, they don't believe it. But I've seen there at the ranch, it would be a hundred and oh, two hundred yards probably to the barn from the house. And we had to take some number nine wire and put some rings on it, put some ropes on the rings, 
We laid that wire from the house to the barn, and when you went from the house to the barn, you reached out there and got your rope, and you followed, you held on that rope, and you went to the barn. Couldn't see it. No way. And overnight, when you'd go to bed, the only clean spot on that bed the next morning would be where your head lay. It'd be white, and the rest of it would be kind of like that fireplace over there. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. Just kind of red dirt? Dirt. And the horses, it was terrible. We'd take a gunny sack, cut them and make ear deals for them, so we'd go tie them <coughs> over their head and we'd soak them in water and put that hang, hang it down there and let that, so the horses could breathe through that water. And then you had to carry you a bucket of water with you or a tub barrel to wash those out with because after, oh, 20 or 30 minutes, they would be so full of dirt that the horses couldn't breathe. The air wouldn't go through them. So finally we just had to shut down. And if you went started out, you went so far and you'd get up on top of a hill and you'd look to see if there's any dust storm coming if there was, you turn around and you rode like hell to get home before that hit. You couldn't no wage. No What'd they look like when they were approaching those dust storms? Did you ever see a river come up in a flash flood? All right, now, can you, you remember how dirty that water was right in front of it? And how it was rolling and twisting and everything. It wasn't just a natural flow, it was just boiling. Mm -hmm. That's what they looked like. Yeah. Don't you think that's about right? Yes, that's right. I think that's a good explanation that you could make on that. Did your father ship any cattle east during those years? Do what? Did your father ship any cattle east? East. Eastern Oklahoma. Oh okay. yes, we all we went to in the thirties when the drought and the dust storm. We moved all the cattle out here and went down by Oto and went up in the Flint Hills. What was the man's name that shipped the cattle to Oto? The Chipton Chapel. Ralph Chapel. Ralph Chapel. Yeah, he lives over at the yep. Yeah, we Shattuck. interviewed him. You did? And he talked about... Now he, would be, he was quite interesting, wasn't he? Yep, he talked about your father making arrangements for about 300 head, and he just called Ralph and said, bring some cattle, and he brought over 1,000 head. <laughs> yeah, I told him to send them all the cattle we sent them one day. We did. <laughs> Got there and didn't have no place to put them on the out in the road. Mm-hmm. Well, do you have any? No, I, I think we, can you think of anything else that we should say for the future generation? That's what we're working for. Well, I would say this. I'm 73 years old now, and if I could have my life to live over and have the opportunities to choose the time and the area. I think that probably in 1925 to 1935, not later than 40, was probably the best time of my life. Of course, I was physically fit, knew what I wanted to do, and could do it. Now then, education is a wonderful thing. It's very necessary, especially in our time now. But back in those days, it was what you could do with your hands and what you could do in a way with a desire. Now then, the people anymore, it appears to me that they don't have the desire to get ahead and do things. I know back in those days, in my father's time, why, if you ask for charity from 
government or something like that, that would be unheard of. But, by the same token, the people took care of those people. If they were needed help, they helped. But the people wanted would do it on their own. They, they didn't go out and say, give me, give me, give me. If you don't give me, I'll do this. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. So I think right in there is probably, in my thinking, the best time. Mm -hmm. Of course, my father would tell you that back in the 80s it would probably be. But I think there's a time in there when you say, Oh, 21 or 2, up to possibly 40 is the best time yep. of anybody's life. I think they can do more of what they want to do, physically, mentally, and so it's that. Where were you living in 47? 1947, I was living on this ranch right out here, east of uh, North Town. How close did that tornado come to the ranch? Oh, and well, that one in the tornado? No, I was living up my headquarters up there. But I was in Oklahoma City when it happened. And I heard it on the radio and I came here. My mother and father was in this house and they were all right. So then, I couldn't get through town, so I went back south, went around and went to Supply, and we got Supply. I called my wife and asked her how everything was out there. She said, fine. I said, well, didn't get a terrible wind. Oh, I said the wind blew a little while, a while ago, but he said, it's not well, it's all nice that we're getting some rain. Thank goodness, you know. But I, my headquarters are down in a horseshoe shape. And the storm hit it on the hit on the little big hills to the south, went up and went over and didn't come down to go and flew across my headquarters. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have shingles out of place. So then you, I came back here and went to work here. What'd you do here to help in Woodward? Well, I had been in Oklahoma City and I brought back a case of whiskey. I never will forget that. And old Doc uh, Dewar and Doc, hmm, what were the two brothers that was here before Dewar? Hmm. One of them went to Col to Colorado. <coughs> and then I went out here to the hospital. They had people just laying up and down the hall and everything. The doctor came by and said, say, you wouldn't happen to have a bottle of whiskey? I said, yeah, I got a case. And she said, go get it. So I went and got my case of whiskey, brought it in, and set it down in there in the hall. That was the last I saw of that case of whiskey. But they used it to a pretty good advantage because they was out of morphine. Said, well, they gave me what morphine they had, and I went to giving shots. I told Doc, I said, Doc, I never gave one of these in life. He said, how many cattle have you vaccinated? And I said, thousands. He said, well, there's not a bit of difference. Just the rougher you treat them, the less it'll hurt. Heck, I found out, I started out just pushing them in, they screamed. Just I said, it looked like that. And didn't have nothing. Mm -hmm. So I got, the only thing was, when my gut was getting low, I've been working quite a little while. He said, how many needles have you used? I said, this is the same one. <laughs> you know, I wasn't very clean. I didn't boil them between each shot. <laughs> I learned a lot of things then but, then. but then you did what you could. I had a bunch of bulldozers here in town. They was working. And we had that old big snow. Heck, I was wanting to get the bulldozers out to the ranch so we could feed the cattle. When I finally could call down here, I couldn't get back and forth. 
So I called Danny and got a hold of some people finally. I said, where's my bulldozer? He said, right now, I said, two of them, one of them's got a doctor in each one of them, and the other one has got two patients in the cabin to bring them to the hospital. Hell, they just, that's the only way they get around that in that snowstorm. But when they had that tornado, it was something. What did the town look like? What? What did the town look like? You've seen pictures of it, haven't you? Ever bit of that bad. The thing was, the pictures that you see are just in areas. But if you could have had one picture that would show it at all, it would have been terrible. Don't you think? Oh, yes. It would have been a lot worse than, than what it shows. Just this little piece here and this little piece over here. If you had it all put together, I don't know. It's, see pictures of the bombs that they dropped in Japan. Wasn't quite that bad, but very much. I wonder why they didn't take an aerial picture of it. What? I wonder why somebody didn't take an aerial picture of it. I don't know. I've never seen one. Maybe. I haven't either. Come think of it. But. Hmm. Well, that would have been something. Yeah. I know out there at the ranch we found marriage licenses, everything from Higgins, Texas. And we found some books out of a library at Canadian. And then just all over. They lay along in old big hills up there. Is it true they found the bodies of two little girls across the river? I've heard that, but I've never had it confirmed. Either, but. You know, there's some that just flat disappeared. Mm -hmm. They never did find them. They don't know whether they were kidnapped or put down that rubble and burned. Do you have any? Of course, if we hadn't had all that rain, we'd have had a lot more fire than we had. Yeah. Uh, you might tell us about your family to finish up our tape. My own personal family? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a son and a daughter. And what are their names? Susie was married to Jody Enselman. Had three children, two boys and a girl. Scott, Jen, uh, Amy. Son Tom, he has his daughter, a uh, wife named Corrine, had two sons, Justin and Jeff, and they live on the ranch. Susie and her family lives in Pine, Colorado. Sounds like you've had a very interesting life. Hmm? Sounds like you've had a very interesting life with your cow. I have. I've being been, a cow hand. I've enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A lot of my friends said, Bob, why don't you retire? Why don't you quit? Then what would you do? <laughs> All of my friends that have retired and quit, they're dead. Mm -hmm. A few friends I've got still alive, they're working. 
So I think there must be a message there. Yeah, like Mr. Alley. Mm -hmm. 91 years old, goes, works at the ranch every day. Why, he's out there, I bet he's out there running the tractor right now, plowing. Well, Mr. Selman, thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, we went down at 8.30. We were there right on time with Mr. Selman. Okay, this is August 29th. 1985. This is Joe Todd and Bernice Jackson, an interview with Mr. James W. Young in Woodward, Oklahoma. So where were you born? In Woodward, 1920. What month and day? Uh, uh, June the 20th. Who is your father? James G. Young. And your mother? And my mother was Ethel Forney. F-O-R-N-E-Y? Yes. Uh -huh. Where were your parents from? Uh, both of them were from Woodward at this time. Where were they born? Uh, my mother was born in Kansas, and uh, she was Dr. Forney's oldest daughter. And uh, In fact, that's the house I was born in down on the corner of 9th and Texas. And my father came down from Nebraska. Uh, he was born in Nebraska, close to Stockton, and came down here in the uh, 97, probably. Did he say why he came to Oklahoma? His father brought him down here. <laughs> he was about two years old. Were they homesteading down here? Uh, no, they homesteaded a land in Nebraska. And I, the, the homesteads got to be closed up, and grandfather evidently was kind of a, a traveler and had horses at that time and things like that and wanted to get out of the area up there and came down here because the land had been recently opened. He had already used his homestead right in Nebraska, but he bought some land. He first lived up close to Fort Supply, and uh, then they moved down to the south part of the county, and then he bought this farm out here uh, south of town, which is the one I remember. But, uh, of course. Were either one of your grandfathers or great-grandfathers in the Civil War? Yes. Uh, Grandfather Young was a, uh, about 14 years old at that time and was a drummer boy with the uh, Illinois, I believe. I believe that's what I... Did you know him? No, he died before I was born. Mm -hmm. Ever hear any stories about him? Well, yes. Uh, kind of. He, he actually was an itinerant horse trader, uh, as I understand it, and uh, traveled quite a little bit doing that. Way, even from here, went way down in South Texas, trading horses. And then he brought a lot of goats up into this country, which he used to clear the land with. Down south they did this, and then this uh, area close here, in, uh, south of town here. Mm -hmm. And it worked very well. They cleaned the shinery and the uh, sagebrush and uh, stuff. And it, it was in, he had a lot of people wanting him to graze the goats just to clear, clear the land without having to plow it up. Hmm. What was his name? His name was James K. Young, and he originally came from Tennessee. He was born in Tennessee. And then his father and mother were killed or died from something and an ant raised the children in Iowa. And then he drifted on up into Nebraska that way and met my grandmother up there. Then they came down here. Okay. What kind of work did your father do? My father was was an attorney in Woodward. Now. He was he was actually a superintendent of schools in Sealing for about 24, after he got out of World War I. He stayed in the Army for a little while. And then uh, he was in Sealing until 29 as superintendent, and then he came here and was county attorney from 30 until the war broke out in 42. And then he was called back into service and stayed in the Army until about 53 or something, and then he became the county judge and stayed as the county judge and the supernumerary judge until he died, mm -hmm. which was in 79. But he So, as a small boy, what chores you do around the house here in Woodward? What work did you do? Oh, we 
chop the wood and for the stoves. And uh, of course, my father decided that, that we needed to learn to work, so he moved us out to the farm when I was fairly young, too. And so we decided that's you boys need to find something to do, and that's exactly what we did. We moved to the farm. And at that time, it became different because at that time, we'd milk cows and we'd uh, chop the wood for the stoves because we were still cooking on wood stoves. And we used harnesses. We used horses at that time. We had uh, horses and mules both on that farm. And they were, all the work that we did at that time was with horses. We didn't have a tractor until oh, somewhat later. They were out, but they weren't on rubber yet. But uh, we uh, plowed the ground and planted it and milked about 50 head of cows. And Did you prefer working with horses or mules on the farm? Oh, I don't know. Uh, we used the mules more. Uh, I think I preferred the mules. They, uh, uh, yet horses are easier to handle. That, uh, but we didn't have any trouble with the mules. They were the red mules, and we got along with them pretty good. How many acres of land could you plow in one day? <laughs> I don't know if they ever gave you the thought on acres. You, you're talking about a walking plow, there. Yeah. And it's from sun up to sundown, but I don't know how much it was. <laughs> we I really, truly really don't know. Because you know, it wasn't anything that we paid any attention to. We just got started at it. And I was trying to think in my own mind. Uh, Maybe an acre and a half. Mm -hmm. It uh, didn't seem like very much now. Mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, where was the farm? It's just three miles south of town. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where did you start school? In Sealing. What year? In 1926. And then I graduated from Woodward. We came back up here when I was in about the fifth grade. And then I went through the Woodward school then. Mm -hmm. And then graduated from high school here in 1938. 1938. How did the Depression affect you and your family in the 30s? Well, really, of course, I don't remember that. I can't remember ever being hungry. I can remember things that we wanted to eat, you know, that maybe we didn't have at that time. But because of the fact that we had the cows, and uh, the products from them, we went, and then we had the farm where we could raise things. And my granddad, Forney, Dr. Forney, had a large Jersey herd here, and he sold milk in town, so there wasn't anything that we didn't have, as a rule. It, uh, but, you know, we were all raised under the same area, and, and nobody had anything, and we didn't either, so, but we didn't know anybody had anything else. Mm -hmm. And so we were kind of, I think, this high school class that I'm in, it, we were all raised up just kind of like brothers and sisters, and, we, and it's still that way, kind of, because we all didn't even, I don't think we realized we did without, because we just did it, everybody got along, nobody did anything different, and it was all right. I don't, by today's standard, I guess there were a lot of things we didn't have, <laughs> but uh, at that time, I don't think we realized that we didn't uh, have it. Uh, the clothes that everybody wore were like coveralls and overalls, and that's what everybody wore, so it was all right. I I don't really remember anybody that I knew that was really hungry. I remember when we lived in the city here a little bit. I, well, when we lived at the, when we at the farm too, the railroad track ran right through the farm, and once in a while we'd have hobo stop off, and it seemed like we always had uh, a old sandwich for them or something like that. But uh, I don't. Uh, it I expect probably I remember the dirt storm more than I do the. Uh, Anything that was caused by the depression, Brad. Tell me about the dirt. Because they, uh, they were, they were, the dirt just blew hard, and it'd be black or red in our area. We weren't in an area that so much dirt blew, except by just the wind blowing it straight ahead. We were kind of the settling off. Now the panhandle, that we got that dirt out there because it would circle around and come up, and then it drip down and drop in on us, even though the wind might be blowing. But. Uh, dirt was in the house, there was no way that you could uh, keep the dirt from settling in in the house, just even the best houses, uh, no matter how they were built, they had dust in them the next morning after one of those dirt storms. Would you do anything to try to keep the dust out? Yes, we'd put rags in the windows and uh, what little, there was no caulking material like we know it then, but we used these little felt strips and we used little pieces of rag to stuff in the window and close them down tight in between the panes. Uh, but and that helped, but you know it seemed like it just had a dust layer when one of those things was over. Maybe they last two or three days, 
I don't remember any that lasted any longer than that. Most of them were one day duration, mm -hmm. but it seemed like that they, uh, at the farm, it's after one of those over wets, well, then all of us went to work dusting the house, and they'd last until the next one. Didn't It uh, didn't seem like it was anything out of the ordinary. But what does a dust storm look like when it's approaching? Just a large, dark cloud. It, uh, I never, I never did see the one they talk about of the, what do they call it, Black Thursday or something like that. Like I, a Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. I, I didn't see that one coming in. I don't know where I was. There didn't, it didn't make a, uh, an impression on me. But just, I remember the one they're talking about because just all of a sudden we were just in wrapped in dirt, and the wind was blowing real hard. And you put her, little out at the farm, we put a little neckerchief around her neck, around her face and nose. So it seemed like it's a little easier to breathe that way, and then you get lean into the wind, and uh, got along. It didn't. Uh, Were there many cases of dust pneumonia? There was some. Granddad was the uh, uh, county health officer at that time. I think they took turns probably doing that, perhaps. But I remember that. Uh, I remember him talking about it because at the first one, they didn't know what it was to begin with, and uh, the. Remember the little signs they used to have? They had pneumonia, scarlet fever. The little they put them on the house, or there wasn't any for that. They had pneumonia signs, but uh, it didn't react like the regular pneumonia. And then later on, they'd be kind of dust pneumonia. But there there was some, but I don't remember it being hazardous here. It, uh, it, uh, it was out of Beaver. Was it? But it was much worse. Yes, yeah. because it was picking up out there. Yeah. We have some land out in that country, and uh, and and it it just blew. Yes. And it just, uh, I never ever driving back out there to see it. It just picked the dirt up and, well, it just settled here. We probably picked up two, three inches of your dirt right <laughs> yes. here, literally. And, uh, but the next day it came back. Yeah, <laughs> but it, <laughs> that's true. It wasn't such a bad thing. It, you know, when you when you have something, you just kind of have it. You get along with it. You adjust to it. And, you, and when it doesn't happen, you kind of, well, I don't understand why it's not here today. But right here, most of our dust was just blowing off the fields or blowing down the and then I think perhaps other than beaver, for instance, you were plowing up a lot more land than we were here. We were still cattle, in which a lot of that was done. And uh, it, we hadn't got extensively plowed like they had there. A little harder to plow that hilly land. And some of the farmers didn't get out and try to stop it. They thought it was a useless task. Yeah, I bet that's uh, true. We found that to be true. Uh, we found here, I know some of these fellows here who did farm, who did have a little blowing cut out with a lister and flat crosswise, and it would slow it down. It, uh, but our, I don't think our, most of our plowed area around here, as I remember, was not that large. There were smaller acreages about that. My husband would get out and plow with a lister, mm -hmm. but the neighbor south of us just let it lay, and our pasture was way and lay just north of that field. Mm -hmm. Looked like a plowed field. Yes, it would. It was just covered. The grass was just covered. And he had nothing but weeds there for a long time. Yeah, well, and, and that'll hold. That'll help hold the wind. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do any work with the shelter belt program? Yes, we had one. We, we had one of the first shelter belts that were put in here. Uh, Dad was re at this time, Dad was still in the county attorney's office, and uh, the county agent sold him on to the idea that he should try it and see if it would work. And it's out there right now. It's a real nice. It runs a, it's a half a mile. Run, of course, it runs east and west. Uh, and it had everything. It had the, in our particular one, there's no cedar trees in it. It started out with the desert willow and then built up to the, which is the tall trees would be the uh, elm and the, uh, uh, see there's some bodock on that thing. That's on the outside edge. I guess the tallest tree is the elm. There's some ash in there also. A little bit of everything in that shelter belt, except cedar. Why it, no cedar? Uh, it was just, the, the, some of them had cedar and some of them didn't. It just depended on what was shipped in at that time. And uh, we just got, this was the pattern that they shipped into the, on the seedlings, and it did real well. When was that shelter belt planted? 1937, maybe. 36 or 37. What's the background of that program, shelter belt program? Well, we always heard it was a background from that uh, President Roosevelt was uh, introducing that he got the idea out of Russia that was stopping the wind over there. That was the story that we heard. And it does work. There, we, there was a sandy field right on the south side of that thing.
that is all completely back to grass now. But that was one of the reasons why it was planted on there to protect that area, and it was on the south side. It, why does the shelter belt work? What is it? The wind goes up and over it. Mm -hmm. It'll come in from the direction, and the idea of planting a small shrubs on the either side of it was to start the wind up, and then as the shelter belt gets, uh, you notice over the country generally, you see, as they get as they get wider, it also gets higher, and then it goes back down on the other side also. They're built the same way, just kind of like a roof, and they even look like that. Yeah. How wide are those things? I expect ours is uh, probably 30, 35 or 40 yards wide, perhaps. Mm -hmm. It, uh, now, when the wind goes up, does it drop the dirt also? When it, it doesn't drop that quick. A, they've got a they've got a rating on them. Is the, the trees are so tall, the wind will go that further far before it comes down. It's strong. Now you got to breeze through, of course, all the time. But uh, you can actually the cattle are used the same way. They get up in there when the wind is in. They'll be laying down out away from it, and and you can tell the difference when on top of a hill it grew shorter. The wind's stronger in that same area, a little closer in than it is in the shelter belt. Hmm. The, the, the idea worked, yeah. it, uh, and, and ours have been very successful because both those fields were plowed. Uh, there's no erosion on them at all. Where is that shelter belt? Where is it located? It's just three miles south. Seems three miles south. Yeah. Now, did you work on that shelter belt? Do I work on it? No, did you work on it? Oh, that? no. Uh, I was there at the time it was being dropped in, but they brought a crew of men in that were being paid out of one of the farm, out of one of the programs. Was that a CCC program? I don't know if it's CC. This could have been WPA. I don't believe CC camp was here when that was planted. Okay. Uh, probably PWA or WPA one mm -hmm. on that thing, but it worked out of the agriculture department, and that was the way they could earn their fifty cents a day. Mm -hmm. And how long are those shelter belts? Well, ours is only half mile long. I think probably they, they could vary, but uh, that that the length of ours. But it stood up real well. Most of the trees, of course, they die, and we pull them out. In fact, I we worked almost two months cleaning out this year the shelter belt from the damage that was done from the ice storm last January, in December, January. And do you replace trees in that shelter belt? No, no, we don't replace any of them. We just cleaned them out. Mm -hmm. They do replace themselves somewhat. It's from seedlings. Mm -hmm. It's just like a small forest. Mm -hmm. Nice place because we trimmed it up high enough so you can ride a horse through it or even drive through it. And there are also some wildlife that, that, that's come in because of it. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Dr. Forney. What was he like? Oh, he was a great fellow. <laughs> he came down here from Kansas uh, to to open up a, uh, a, a doctor's office here. He was a physician, family practice. Uh, and he, uh, well, he lived in that house. He lived on the same corner where you just came from, Bob Salmon's corner. They lived there. They lived in another house up the street there a little ways, and then, then they moved down about uh, 1918, moved into that house down on the corner of Ninth in Texas, which was a two-story house down in there, and he operated a family practice in Woodward up until just almost the time he died, which was in the 40s, 41, I think. And, uh, but he uh, was just a family physician. Most, a lot of the children that are my age, well, he delivered and some, a lot of them, a lot younger too. At an office down on the corner there, there was uh, right off of Main Street. He'd, that I mean, right off of the house, right on that corner. Mm -hmm. But and he, as a hobby, he got involved in this Jersey cow business, and uh, and and really had some very outstanding animals statewide. I mean, the uh, uh, president of Oklahoma State University used to visit with me occasionally because he remembered him. He'd come out here to judge him when he was a young man starting in the university there. What was his name? Wilhelm. Wilhelm. Dr. Was, Wilhelm. Yeah, was I remember him. Yeah, it, uh, I'd see him occasionally and I got to talk to him so much that he recognized me when I'd come in because he ate there at Student Union Building every night and uh, after a football game I'd visit with him. He always remembered Dr. Forney and his juries. Mm -hmm. it, uh, but Dr. Forney, as I understand it, uh, actually he and another man actually brought in the very first movie that was shown in Woodward. It was shown on an outside wall downtown on one of the vacant buildings. But he was rather an aggressive person. He thought people ought to see one. That's the only one. He just brought the one in. And they, what year was that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Before my time. <laughs> or early in the film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, 
let's go back to where his father came over to Fort Supply. Yes. What kind of a house did he build? They lived in a dugout. We found that dugout. We went back with Dad several years ago, and we went back in that thing, and it's about five miles. Oh, it's not that far. It's in the area that used to call the old Red Hill area, where there was this, where, when the Teamsters came through here, there was a place out in South Woodward, just about a half mile from where we are now, where the, where the, on the wagon road, there's some dugouts over there now, and you can still see little signs of them on there, where there's a place to camp, it's close right. to a creek, mm -hmm. and then the next distance to camp was on up toward Fort Supply. It wasn't quite at Fort Supply, but there was a, a large lake in there, which is probably a, a leakage from the Canadian River come through that on that thing that lake would fill up with water and it was a camp area right close and they went lived in that area and uh, dug into that hill and made a made a dug out there and lived there about uh, a year year and a half and it right in that area did he buy a, a relinquishment or did he, did he I think he just squatted oh, he just I think he just had to I think he just hadn't found where they wanted to be yet and he had some of these goats with him at this time, too. Oh. Then there became a place up down south. What year was this that he came? Oh, let's see, that'd be in about 96 or 7. We might have to go back to the tape, because I think it's on this tape. Okay. And uh, uh, th then they stayed there about a year and a half, and then they moved on down in the south end of the county, and there's a lake down there. It's just right, still in Woodward County, but it's just right on the southwest edge of it. Uh, that it's the old Lucas land now, and we were, went back down there, and we also found that they lived in a partial dugout down there, part dugout and part of a little uh, shanty kind of a place. And they were down there a couple of years, and then they bought this place up here. Mm -hmm. And and the oldest daughter uh, homesteaded the West 80 on that. But she didn't. She that was. The rest of the, the she bought they bought the rest of it because they couldn't homestead it or thought they could not I don't know whether they could or not but Aunt Jenny did homestead that West 80 and then it became part of the farm and at that time they had about 480 acres which was the maximum that they had here and it not much of it was broken out most of it was in fruit trees and but they didn't break out Granddad was not a farmer and he didn't want to farm the goats were all right and uh, because they cleared, the, but he primarily was still interested in horses, mm -hmm. and he traded those things around. Now, I don't think he ever did much more than just make a decent living because he was he lose money trading horses. <laughs> That's a story I understand. Anyway. Well, yeah. when did you become judge? Dad became a judge in about fifty. You might he ran for judge when when he was still in the army. He thought he was going to get out about 1948 or 50, somewhere along in there, and he ran for the ran for it and was elected judge, but he didn't fill a spot because he came. He, he, they didn't let him out of the army, so he had to stay in the army until he came back, and then it was probably about 54 before he actually became judge because he got recalled back again. Korea? No, well, kind of. Uh, it was during that time, but he hadn't actually been let completely out. He got called back in to help. They, at this time, the Air Force was rewriting their courts martial manual, and he and the Colonel Porter were involved in this thing, and they called him back in to complete the manual, mm -hmm. and then he just stayed in until he retired, just a, a few years, I don't know. How high did he go in there? He was a colonel. And uh, then he, but then he became county judge and stayed there until he just retired from. Where did he get his education? Uh, University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Law? Yeah, well, yes. Well, actually, he was a chemistry major, but he de he studied law while he was up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, but he didn't uh, take his bar exam until he was down here in Oklahoma, which would have been about, could have been 28. I'm not, I don't know about that for sure, but while we were still in ceiling when he passed, took the bar examination. And at that time, he was well, what about World War One? Did he have anything to do with that? He was in World War One. Uh, I think probably 1917 was when he got involved in World War One. And but 
because of his education background, they were needing some teachers, and so he stayed in after World War One, and I actually was, moved, was transferred up to uh, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, and stayed there until about 1922 and taught school up there in the Army. Mm -hmm. And then when he came back out, then he taught school here in Woodward a couple of years, and then took the superintendent job in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And after that's when he became interested in the law. And then he was in World War II? He was actually in World War One, in World War Two, and in the Korean conflict. That's right. They wanted to make a soldier out of him. Too. Yeah, they darn near made a soldier out of all, all three of us. They, there were three boys in the family, and, and, and at one time all four of us were were in the army, were officers in the army all at the same time. In fact, twice, because one was during World War II, and then the other one was in the Korean War, and I got called back in, too. And so did my youngest brother. And uh, so we were all in the Army at the same time. What did your father do in World War I? He was a training officer in Camp Grant, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And he kept thinking he'd go overseas, but they didn't ever send him. Because it, they, they had so few officers at that time, or had so few people who were college graduates, that those who could and would teach, they, that's what they put him into. So yeah. they, they didn't ship him out. They shipped several people out around him, but he was in his training company. Yeah. What did you do after high school? My, me? Yeah. I went over to uh, Stillwater, went to school at Oklahoma at and then I went in the Army in 1942, and stayed in the Army until 1947, and uh, stayed with the, uh, so we had, I was with the prisoner war camp for a couple of years here, and then when I went over in Japan, I was the personnel officer for the prosecution of war criminals in Japan. What did you study at Stillwater? Pardon me? What did you study at Stillwater? I started out, I thought, well, I should do the same thing my father did and I should study law. So I started out in pre-law and that was such a dry subject that I'd changed the School of Agriculture. <laughs> that was very interesting. And that was a good thing because that's what I eventually, like, you know, wanted to do. Then. And you went there, what, three years? I was there four years. Did you graduate? Yeah, no, I didn't. I never. I didn't get a degree. The war came out, and I joined the army. Mm -hmm. I would add, well, I got my commission ROTC, and we got out. Before. I still, I still lack four hours of graduating. I just didn't go back. It didn't seem like it was necessary. What was your the highest rank in the war? I was a captain. Captain. And uh, where did you go to? Uh, where did you take your basic training? Well. Of course, at this time I was second lieutenant when I went in the right, army, and right. we went to Mineral Wells, Texas, and I was in a training company there. It was Camp uh, Walters in uh, Mineral Wells. Mm -hmm. Then we went from Mineral Wells, we went on to uh, join the 33rd Division, and up in Camp Lewis, Fort Lewis, and then from uh, what branch were you? I was in infantry. Yeah. And uh, then I had a I had a I had a very good friend of mine that volunteered me for the military police corps. <laughs> and uh, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me because this division I was with, that company was completely wiped out in the Philippines. Oh. But I was had gotten into the military police at that time, and that's when I got involved with uh, the pr German prisoners of war. And that was rather not, uh, not go, that was not a bad experience. Did you go overseas? No, well, not this time. Later, but the, the Germans were here. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the PO Daily camp here. What were your duties? I was the adjutant of the camp. And this, uh, we had 5,000 prisoners of war who came out of the African Corps. They uh, were all volunteers to come to the United States to work. We had uh, several of them who were, uh, uh, there were we, we later found, of course, we had a lot of SS in the group, but we had to learn how to identify them. And when we find out how we could identify them, then we removed them. But, but they were just infiltrated in them. There weren't many. Uh, but most of these boys were below the rank of corporal. But they wanted to work, and they did work. They worked in the fields in Utah. They picked beets, they picked cherries, they picked pears, they picked apples. They they harvested all the crops in the, in the at the time. Those crops would have gone to waste if it had not been for this type of labor. Uh, they didn't get paid very much. We'd contract them. We'd contract the labor for so many dollars a day. The prisoner got a dollar of it. The rest of the money went back to help feed him and clothe him, and then. The Profit went back to the Ninth Service Command, and we turned over a considerable profit each year. That was just a con it was just contract labor, is exactly what it was, but it had nothing to do with the war effort. Where was the camp located? In Ogden, 
out in Utah. Okay. It, uh, Wasn't there such a camp over here by... They had a camp in Alva. In Alva. In Alva. I don't... We ship prisoners out from different spots. You know, if you had some prisoners that you couldn't control, well, you could ship them someplace. If you had, we had a lot of Russians. We had one group of Russians in this group, and we shipped them out as soon as we found out who and where and what they went. Went back to, well, they went to Moscow, Idaho, was where they went. And of course, they all knew they were going back to Moscow, and that created kind of a funny little deal. But uh, which they did. Uh, if you had, but we didn't have many troublemakers. We had a very good commanding officer. In fact, Colonel Erickson's still alive. He was a World War One man. He was extremely fair. We had very, very little problems. We didn't have anybody that we could not handle. How did you identify the SS soldiers? They had a tattoo. They were tattooed. Where? Uh, under their armpit. Hmm. They, and then we found out this is where it was. Well, we could go through them real easy and pick them out. They, uh, they probably, if we had not known how to identify them or didn't find out about it, we might have had some problems because they were they were a little different type of soldier. What would you do with them? Uh, we sh they had a camp. Seemed to me like it was, I can't remember where it was. I believe it was somewhere in Nebraska. But we shipped them all to a center, to a central area. Those, those boys were all housed in, in one particular area. And I don't remember where that was. I don't, uh, but it uh, seemed like it could have been uh, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, perhaps. Now, what were your average duties at the camp every day? What did you do? As an adjutant? Yeah. Oh boy. Well, I guess we started off in the morning by counting the prisoners every morning at 5.45. And then I took care of all the correspondence and paperwork at the camp. Part of the personnel records, even though we had a personnel officer, but sometimes the adjutant, those two jobs overlapped somewhat. Uh, we took care of all the correspondence and all the filing, oversaw the post office, and uh, even reviewed all the letters that came in by the prisoners of war, censored those. But they, we didn't have much of that. Uh, really, we we made all administrative decisions uh, in the camp out of, our, out of this office. Mm -hmm. The adjutant's office is an administrative office for a division type or a battalion type headquarters. Uh, what type of barracks did you have at the camp? Wooden, wooden barracks. Mm -hmm. Were they like regular military barracks? Yes. In fact, it was an abandoned, it was a camp that had been built, and then we moved into it because the facilities were, were there and, and vacant. It evidently at one time had been occupied by a group of soldiers, perhaps, and then moved out. Mm -hmm. How many soldiers to the barracks? Well, we had 80 in that, in that, uh, in the PW camp. Mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, you said you didn't have much trouble with the soldiers there. No, with the Germans, yeah, we didn't. Uh, they, they, it took them a little while to find out that we weren't the smallest country as they were. We had had six different incidents in which people got out of the combat. We got them back in just three, or four days. Nobody ever got away from us completely. Mm -hmm. But they really thought that they could just travel 30 or 40 miles and they'd be out of the United States and they'd be in Mexico and be free. They just didn't realize how large it was. But uh, most of them surrendered. They get hungry. They get out and be out without food for two or three days, and they get hungry and they turn themselves in, and uh, or be picked up by military police somewhere that was looking for them and uh, bring them on back. They were kind of glad to get back. Mm -hmm. What was the their attitude to being prisoners over here? The average German. I don't think they minded it. When we first got them, they were very, very hungry people. They had been in North Africa and and, and they had not been well fed there, and they were thin. But when they got here, I think they were just happy to be here. The ones that I talked to seemed to be real pleased that they were out of it, mm -hmm. and that now then they could eat. And they didn't mind working; they were good workers. Uh, the farmers out in the area, once they got a hold of them, even requested some of the same ones back each time if they could. But normally we just ship them out by how many men do you want? But we ship the same ones back to the same farmer uh, each day if we knew what he wanted. Um, did you have? What about guarding the prison? Have to keep a, a tight guard on them, or? Well, not really. We sent a guard out with every ten people, but uh, we didn't have that many guards at that one time, and so gradually we'd get up to twenty and just send somebody with them to make. They always had a gun with them, mm -hmm. but made sure that they put them on the truck and got them back on the truck and got them back and forth. They could have gotten away if they wanted to, but they don't think they wanted to. Mm -hmm. They had. Uh, of course, bar 
barbed wire fences, double lap job around the outside. But we had a complete hospital facility there. And what did they do for recreation? The Germans? Both played soccer. The, uh, a lot of soccer players. They had. Uh, that was primarily their out their outdoor deal. They'd have little field game, little like track meets or stuff like that, kind of small. But most of them played soccer, and then they had billiard rooms that they could play pool. And a lot of checkers, and a lot of chess. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty good library. It was uh, German books, some American, and we had an art colony that. Uh, that I still correspond with a the fellow there that headed that up. His name is Erwin Schott. He lives in Munich. And I've seen him a couple of times since there in Munich. Mm -hmm. uh, but he organized, and the, so they could go down there and, and do some painting, some wood carving, uh, could build chests and build uh, tables or something like that. It, they had pretty good. They had something for them to do if they wanted to do it. Uh, and then, of course, the Germans were great walkers. You know, in the evening you'd see them out just walking around the compound, just the kind of a track that was laid on the outside, and they'd just, just walk it. And how long were you there? Two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. And they sent me to Japan in the military government. The and I got pulled off and put in this, uh, in this headquarters of, of SCAP at this GHQ, this prosecution work What did you do there? I was a personnel officer, mm -hmm. and uh, but we uh, that was an interesting subject because in a war criminal deal you had a deal where you picked up the rumor, you made the investigation, you filed a charge, and then you uh, sent it into Washington to be reviewed. If they reviewed it correctly, you sent it back and you tried them in uh, Yokohama. What were some of the cases you worked on over there? Well, there'd be a lot of those cases that I didn't get involved with on that because we just reviewed them on that. Because here I go back to personnel officer, and I'm in charge of the personnel who's mm -hmm. brought in and who used them, and I pay them and see that they're there and where they are, and hired the civilians that worked for us. And we had a number of those, and made sure that the witnesses that came back had a place to stay, and put them in the billet because they were came in to, to testify against the Japanese. And uh, then, but and then outfit in Yokohama, and then they went ahead and made the dead whatever the decision was if they hung him or whatever it was, well, then that's what they carried out. What's the highest ranking person that you worked on in that case? You mean the Japanese? Yeah. Well, the high tribunal was on out in the other deal, so the highest one we would have worked on have been equivalent to a lieutenant colonel or a colonel, perhaps, on that thing. And they no. were held responsible for some particular atrocity that. Team off, or even in the Philippines, we had an office in the Philippines at the same time that, instant, that reviewed those atrocities down there, and most of those were people that were held responsible for. Uh, sometimes we pick up the enlisted men who were responsible, or camp commanders uh, up at Hokkaido, for instance. We had some of those that were back in there. Did you ever deal with anyone from the Bataan area, Bataan Death March? I had a uh, good friend that uh, became a good friend that was on this march uh, who worked in our who worked in our operation. What about any of the Japanese that were? I don't remember specifically. Mm -hmm. on, on those, we uh, had some specific little incidents that have some of those were pretty pretty bad. <laughs> what were they? came before in the uh, Philippine area where you tried a major who was wanting to accost one of the Amer American nurses there and she refused his advances and he just pulled his sword off and just took her head right off. And uh, of course he was hung. But uh, but those incidents, uh, I for they, there were a lot of them. I remember that one because I reviewed it with somebody not too long ago. I had a, one of the one of the fellows that lived with us on the thing was in the camp in Hokkaido. This was a Marine captain, and he weighed around. He he weighed close to 300 pounds. He was a big man. He weighed 97 pounds when they got him out of the camp. But that was they were up there to testify against the camp commanders who let these things go on. They were the drug problem there was they were vermin ridden, lots of rats and mice, and they weren't able to clean up. Didn't that, uh, Primarily, just brutality. They just 
making them do what they wanted to do and shove them around. It not. Uh, I used to remember a lot of those, but fortunately, well, we've forgotten most of them. Yeah. Unless somebody would remind me. I don't know why I remember that Filipino day. I, I do remember because I was talking about it to a fellow who was a Filipino about six or eight months ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, who handled the cases like Tojo and? Well, guys. we handled the, the we handled the defense part of that thing, but only for pay only. But that was out of the federal directly. We had nothing to do with that one, except if we paid the defense panel. And I was out there quite a little bit because of that. But uh, I didn't. Uh, we we had nothing to do with that particular mm -hmm. deal. Was the emperor implicated in anything? No. In it? MacArthur was a very very good administrator. He knew the Japanese people, and he was. Uh, I would be a great admirer of MacArthur because I thought he did a real great job yeah. in, in the part that I knew of, which was in the South Pacific and the Philippines on the administration part. But no, they didn't implicate the Kemper in anything. They uh, they did, of course, the firebomb hit that palace and burned it to the ground. And I was in the palace ground real early in the program. But it, uh, the, but he was not implicated in any way. They kept it very, very careful about that, to not do it. But they, the ones that they were after were the people who were, who actually were responsible military for these things that went on. Because I understand the emperor actually is like the queen of England, I guess, is maybe just the figurehead, and that some of the probably at this know, at this time for sure. Yeah. They, they uh, said they had two or three families that ruled Japan, and they had the emperor, but these families ruled. Yeah, I think that's probably still yeah. true, monetarily and mm -hmm. and uh, otherwise. I think it's becoming more predominantly noticeable too. <laughs> Same families are back in control now that we're in control then. Uh, yeah. That doesn't sound good. Yeah, but the but same ones. The right. same names. And, same uh, names. Yeah. I heard that's how, um, was it, his name is Toyota? Was it Admiral Toyota? Yeah, yeah okay. Anyway, this is a story I heard that's true or not, I don't know, but he was in the Navy. At the end of the war, he stepped in and took over all the Navy. And that's how he built up the Toyota business. Yeah. They had a deal over there. They, they wanted to break out. They wanted MacArthur did did, did this, and very, he, he, of course, he understood the Oriental very well. Uh, they broke up all the large family holdings, mm -hmm. uh, Mitsubishi, uh, uh, Mitsui, all of them, and they assigned the. Uh, they gave all the property and all the stores and all the factories and all of them were left and everything. To the person who had been running, mm -hmm. this would be the number one man on the deal. I gave it to him. They didn't understand what how, what loyalty the Japanese people had to the people they worked for. So at the end, and they took it away for 20 years. So in 20 years' time, uh, this was no problem. But that time, the, the owners would own it, and then their families would own it, and all this sort of stuff. But what happened was these people gave it back to the original owners. So at the end of that time, and they took very good care of the stores and uh, the enterprises and the building and stuff like that. So at the end of this time, practically all of this went right back to the same family. That's why I say the same families are back in yeah. control again. Hmm. There are different types of people, and that would in the United States probably wouldn't work, mm -hmm. but it did in Japan. Right. When did you come back to Woodward? In 1947. Before or after the tornado? I came back because of the tornado. My wife was here at the tornado, and uh, I wasn't due to leave Japan until later on. But because of the tornado, I got them to send me home early. I got an early, earlier discharge. I actually wouldn't do out for another about another year. But uh, I came up because the tornado had come and hit, and we didn't know anything about it. Well, I got orders to go home before we found out that we really weren't damaged too badly. But uh, that's why I came what back. What part of town was your wife in? Right across the street over here. <laughs> in the south part of town, mm -hmm. and uh, it did not bother that part of town. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it did a little fall, did a little damage to my grandfather's house, and I got up and fixed the roof when I got back. But uh, it wasn't damaged. Of course, granddad was gone at that time, but uh, they were they had already got, uh, passed on. But uh, that damage wasn't very significant, and uh, just a little roof damage. But the south part of town wasn't damaged at all. What did the town look like? Well, when you first saw it, from the well, of course I came in from the south, and it looked just like it always had uh, when I came when I came in. Uh, but then as they got on down on the other side and got to the northwest side, well, there just wasn't anything there except trees. It, it, 
there were a few da there were a few damaged trees up in that area. And of course, some of the buildings were still down. Uh, some of the, of course, lots of the houses were down. And the red by that time, though, the Red Cross had gotten in and was doing some building already. And I came in about a week after the tornado, about ten days actually. Why were the elevators damaged? Grain elevators. Well, I've always heard it's because of the way they were built, cylindrical. Design because there was an elevator, no wooden elevator, about a half a block from where the Fisher elevators are now, and it was completely gone. It was a wooden, straight up elevator type. Yeah. So, but that's that's what I've always heard because of the design of it. Yeah. And it seemed then it must be right because right down the track those elevators were still there. Mm -hmm. it, uh, they came in. But uh, I've been in and out of Woodward. I worked for the Boy Scouts of America for four years. Went down, that's where I got down to South Texas. Mm -hmm. because you say you were a recall for Korea? Yes. What did you do in Korea? <laughs> they put me right back in prisoner of war work. I was over in that island at Koji that, uh, where they had that 120,000 prisoners. I was over there and I went back in personnel again at the same time again. Tell me about being over there with them. That's depressing. That, that's, that's, uh, that, that was a bad deal. That, uh, it, it wasn't like is completely different from handling the German prisoners. The German prisoners uh, were a, a different group of people. But the Korean prisoners, we had South Koreans, North Koreans, and Chinese. I got pretty well involved in some of the Chinese compounds on the thing. But uh, the uh, but it was it was very depressing. It, it just it, it was depressing. It just. You went to work in the morning, you guarded the prisoners, you went home at night and you hadn't gotten anything done, you didn't do anything, and it was, uh, the prisoners were, seemed like they always were in a squabble, uh, an argument of some type, uh, I don't know that, it, uh, I never did think it was not safe, I, we had troubles in the compounds all the time, but I never did think that I was in any trouble, I think they had a lot of trouble among themselves, they, they'd kill each other in the compounds. They were just uh, the Chinese. I was over there at the time when they, when the first real truce deal was beginning to talk, when they had to uh, number everybody, you know, and go back through and identify everybody to find out where they were and who was here and all this sort of stuff. Separate the South Koreans from the North Koreans. Gave them their choice then of uh, whether they wanted to go back or whether they wanted to stay. Well, the Chinese, they were out of. Uh, 25,000 prisoners, only 5,000 of them wanted to go back to China. And when we found out that, there was no way that truce was going to get signed up that time. And it didn't. Mm -hmm. They took the Chinese prisoners who did not want to go back and sent them to the island of Chosen. And uh, that's where they went. All the Chinese, they were, but the, the 500, they kept them there. It, uh, but that they just didn't want to go back. They had, uh, they had, they were volunteer uh, fighters, but I asked one of the Chinese why they volunteered to come up. And he said, "Well, we were promised two things. One of them that, that we would be able to get two bowls of rice a day. They were been out all in the Shanghai area, and that we would have medical personnel." And I asked him if that if they did it. He said, "Yes, they did." Said they they did feed us and they sent red what we would call Red Cross personnel, really. They were just first aid deal, but they did send them with them. And uh, then, but they weren't, that's why a lot of the Chinese probably surrendered when they came through, when they got a chance. The, of course, I've heard the story of uh, the Americans being overrun by the Chinese. Yeah, that was right, but that was up in the Tegu area. And uh, that was just a, that was a whole front line. That's my, I, I found my brother was in Korea and we got stationed together for a little while and he was in that engineer outfit that built that Han bridge and when they came out of that thing they were trying to evacuate that thing and he said that uh, that he was in the last unit with the engineers that brought their equipment through and they opened the guns up off the road the 105s and 155s and they were because they were ready to and they were approaching and they stopped those things with his Chinese and the North Koreans with instant trajectories. That means they were firing a weapon that went off just beyond the gun deal. Explosion. And that's, he said, that's where they stopped. We were the last ones through. They came on through, they opened the guns up, put the guns back in place again, started firing again. 
they, they came out when they were still firing overhead. But when they finally stopped them, says those guns were shooting at point blank. And uh, they were, I'm sure that's right, Bob would have been, <laughs> because he was there. So that's the way they stopped them, and then they started, then this thing started going back the other way. I can believe because we did that in Vietnam. We yeah. had to. They had the same, same thing as yeah, the, uh, the uh, there was a Canadian outfit that was, uh, I think he called it the Princess Pat outfit, that put a bunch of people back up on the line. South Korean regiment, and they put them back up on the line and held it long enough for them to get them out of there. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it, it, Korea was depressing. I mean, it was a beautiful country. What were those North Koreans like? What, what kind of people were they? Um, arrogant, as far as we were concerned. They, uh, it's a different. They're a different kind of people. Like I say, they kill. They kill each other, uh, and literally. They uh, right in the compound, you know. They, all of a sudden, they couldn't get along with people, you know, and things like that. And then, and then they might do most anything. Uh, but they were an arrogant, self-centered group of people. The Chinese were easy to get along with, and they were very, and they were, they were good people. Uh, we got along with them pretty well. We had some of them who I went down there one time, and out of could you believe it, that out of twenty-five thousand prisoners, there was one man in that outfit who spoke a dialect that which nobody else spoke. And uh, he finally hung himself, and I was down there in the compound to cut him down. And the reason was he couldn't talk to anybody. He got so depressed. And, uh, and they let him, just a little room like this, there were people sleeping right beside him, and he put himself up the rafter, and you could see on the ground where his toes had twitched when nobody interfered with him. That's what he wanted to do. You know, this is, this is his life. That's, a, that's what they believe. This is the Chinese, you know. The Koreans probably helped him out. They were, <laughs> they were difficult to work with. They, uh, he had to be real. Uh, I had a compound with them one time, and I got along with them real well because it, you know, says that this is the way it's going to be. If you don't do it this way, nothing's going to happen. And, it, and uh, I got along with this group all right. You just had to be stronger than they were. That <laughs> so when did you come back to the states then? That time, fifty-two. Fifty-two. Go back in farming. I went, no, I went back to work for Boy Scouts then, and uh, was stationed was, and lived down close to Kingsville. And then I came back up here in Woodward in 1959 as the uh, Chamber of Commerce Manager, mm -hmm. and did that for 14 and a half years, and I was doing the farming and the ranching on the side. And, uh, What'd you do with the Boy Scouts? I would work for, as a, uh, you know, they had some paid personnel. Boy Scout executives use paid personnel to keep the volunteers information and in, in, information that they need to, to and that's what I did. I traveled uh, down south of Kingsville and up above Robstown, Texas, on both sides, and in the Corpus Christi area. They did a good job. They very interesting. Didn't pay very much, but very interesting. Did you have any boys in 4-H? Is that the reason? No, my boys we weren't, didn't get involved in 4-H club. Both the boys were involved in uh, Boy Scout work. They were? And, uh, did they go with you down there? Yes, we all li we lived down there. They were just little kid boys at that time. Oh. And, uh, we, but however, they got involved in the scouting program up there and then, on up, and then back up here also when we came up in here. And uh, we made some trips up on the canoe base up in Canada. Uh, we made pretty good outings. One of the boys is here, is Dennis. The other boy lives in Oklahoma City, is a computer scientist. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you just have the two children? Yes. My daughter died several years ago. Oh. And uh, tell me, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I had uh, two brothers that were younger than I, and a sister. I was the oldest. I had a brother a year and a half younger than I was, and the one that was about six and a half years younger, and then the sister's 13 years younger. Um, was there a highway patrolman by the name of Young? Yeah, Bill Young, yes. Yes, Bill. Yeah. Was he any we, kind? No, we weren't related. Oh, you know? weren't. When we grew up here in Woodward, there were just two young families, and we were not related. Well, now that I think there's about eight or ten. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. my son here is, is the only one that's related. He's a dentist here in Woodward. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, those are just not related anyway. Well, I remember Bill Young. He was a real nice fellow. We knew him real well. His father, his father lived in Sealing, so oh. we had a kind of a little 
connection in there too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he had a sad. Pardon? He had a sad ending. Didn't yes, he? that was that was, that was, that was, that was bad. purely mm -hmm. purely accidental. Bad end. What happened to her? He was shot over in eastern part of the state by one of those people that were chasing back over there. Came out of a roadblock. That's one that we interviewed and. No. We never did interview Bill Young. Probably not. Well, I'm thinking the sheriff that we interviewed down in Shattuck or Arnett that was shot. No, this would have been, uh, this is Highway Patrol. Okay, okay. That, uh, what it would, would call out, he actually was a supervisor at this time, wasn't he? He was on, on the area, he got up that, he was a little... Yes. He lived here, and, he, and his wife still lives here, so he lived there once in a while. But he got called out to help on his roadblock situation when they were hunting for a couple of that were over in that... Uh, Eastern, the Eastern Oklahoma area, and one of them came out of that roadblock and then found him and shot him. I think he was the only one killed. Him. No, there was another man killed with him. Killed him both, I think. I think that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's the sheriff of Ellis County that I interviewed. Well, you must, I must not have been there. I don't yeah, he that. was uh, shot, severed his spinal cord and punctured the lung, and he's confined to a wheelchair now. Oh, that sounds like the boy here in town. The uh, sheriff here, uh, Gaston. Yeah, Gaston. Gaston. Did you interview him? Yeah. AC yeah. Gaston. Yeah, that's. Uh, oh, Creel. I didn't Creel. know you had interviewed him. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Over at Arnett. But, uh, no. Well, it probably was here or close by here. It could have been, or he could have been there. You know, for a little while he was crippled pretty bad, and he could have been. Moved, he could have been in a hospital. Well, he's confined to a wheelchair now. Yeah. And he lives in. It's in either Arnett or Shattuck. Yeah, it, it could very easily have been over to that Shattuck house for a while. No, he's yeah. he's at home over there in the house. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. I don't believe he told us who your wife was. Oh, my, he is. oh, I uh, Marilyn. Her, she was Marilyn Gilbert, mm -hmm. and uh, she was born in Kiowa, Kansas. But they moved here. Her father was the Maytag agency here for years and years and years. Had this whole northwest part of Oklahoma. Ralph Gilbert. Uh, I remember that. Yeah, he's, uh, he had quite a he had a Maytag Empire. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for him for a little while. He was a nice fellow. He really was. I you know I didn't get along with him any better than his father-in-law gets along with his son-in-law. <laughs> but we got along pretty good, really. <laughs> no, are both your parents? Are they both passed away? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Um, can you think of anything that we need to tell the? Great grandchildren, fifty years from now, on these tapes. I don't know whether they want to tell me anything or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> well, that's why we're doing this, you right. know, is to save history for the younger generation. I don't. Know. You know, of course, when when I grew up in Woodward, it was, you know, it wasn't too bad a time. It really, really, we had a good life. Everybody was poor. Nobody there wasn't any. And we really, uh, really had a pretty enjoyable life. We uh, everybody was alike. Did things together. Everybody, nobody, yeah, you know, there wasn't anybody, anybody, anybody else. Nobody thought there were either. Mm -hmm. We all played together, and we walked together, and we danced together, and uh, uh, we just uh, all got along just pretty good. That's the only way we knew that there was that, that was the only way to do it. That was the same way, really, kind of the reason when when we went on to Stillwater to go to college over there, is mm -hmm. it. Uh, I got a job over there and was able to go ahead and go to school. And uh, the, the reason I didn't have enough hours to graduate is because I changed schools, you know. Changed school of arts and science to the school of agriculture and it just didn't work out that way. But by that time I was extremely interested in military science because that was where I could see this is kind of going along at that time. So I spent all my time in that and got along with it pretty good. And uh, you joined the ROTC. Yeah, in, in Stillwater and that's where I got my commission. If you were in infantry, why would you put in personnel with POWs? Uh, I don't know. It's like they'd be wanting infantry officers to go up in the front lines. Well, you know, that was real true. And I, and I was there, I asked this, uh, they put me in this administrative deal, but they promised the Colonel Erickson that if he had any personnel that he did not want to move when they brought him out to camp, that they would not move him. And I, I didn't know this, because I asked a colonel I went back to the East Coast with, and I took some prisoners back one time. Now here, I said, here I am, infantry-based officer, 
I've been in, that, uh, in Utah for 15 months and never uh, never had orders to go overseas. He says, I don't really understand this. Why did it happen? He laughed. He said, well, the reason you didn't go was because your colonel wouldn't let you. He says, you were on orders every month that you were in that camp. And every month that your name came out on the orders, your colonel would get on the telephone and take you off. But they promised him that if he, if, to keep people, that they wouldn't disturb him. And he kept two of us. He kept myself, who was the adjutant, and he kept the personnel officer, who was an, a, who was an AG officer, who probably would not have. But that's that's the reason I didn't go overseas. Just I was the adjutant of the camp, and he didn't want to have to replace him. Yeah. And I didn't. And so I didn't go. I went to Japan, uh, and went overseas. But but it was after the colonel was gone. They shipped mm -hmm. the colonel to Germany, and uh, then. I went over to the military government office. But you know, there were not a lot of administrative officers. There were there were a lot of administrative officers, but there weren't very many of them who, who kind of wanted to be and who, and who stayed there to be. But I wanted to be. I enjoyed it. I liked the military, I, I, the administrative part of it. And uh, for me, it was all right. It, uh, it, uh, my, brother stayed at, my brother stayed in the Air Force until he retired at 30 years. And uh, when he he was pilot, but when he came out of the army, he went to the Inspector General School. And when he went to the Inspector General School, then he stayed in until he retired. But uh, there were a lot of there were a lot of people who did not want to do these administrative jobs. And uh, but to me, they were interesting. you would enjoy listening to this tape because it's kind of fun. Of course, you got to remember, you know Dr. Carmichael, I'm sure. Yes, he's And he and I did this thing, see, together. So he's in this dad. thing, there's a little pattern in there, too. Of course, I'd like, you know, I very much want to get it back. Right. Uh, but if you make two copies, we'll send one of them, another one. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. I'll send one of them to my brother. Okay. okay. Thank my you. youngest brother died several years ago. Yeah. And, uh, but Bill's still down in San Antonio. He knows I've got this, but I just never, even though I go down there a couple, three times a year, I just forget to take it. Yeah. But uh, I, I, cer I certainly would like to have you uh, listen to it, because I think you'll get, there's some things that are covered in there. For instance, I remember you said one time when he left this place that he went into this uh, between, it was about two and a half miles probably at Fort Supply, and he said there were thousands of dead cattle along the river. I don't know what had happened to them, but they were, he said it was, the, the smell was awful, and he was just a little boy. But they went from wagon up to Fort Supply to get supplies and come back. So they were having to go right through the Indian encampments uh, at the Fort Supply area. he area. tells about this. He tells about this in there. And he oh, also nice. talks about uh, about why they went down to the south area. Uh, he talks about some of their life uh, on this prairie land mm -hmm. out there in this sagebrush country. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think he probably tells a story and I think of maybe asking why there were no trees except at the river, and he had a, he knew he that uh, the reason was that the Indians in the spring burned off all the prairie, so that the only trees in the area were along in a wet spot or in the, at the river. I wonder why the Indians did that. Well, of course, they, they, they believed that if they burn it off, then the green grass would show up earlier and the buffalo would come down earlier, remember? Oh, yeah. And uh, he also said the sagebrush was very short. It got larger after they began to fence it, and, and the Indians were not there allowed to burn anymore. Then the sagebrush got tall, like we said. Mm -hmm. But he said when he was a little boy, and the thing, the sagebrush was, was short. And, and the reason was because it was burning. Mm -hmm. But there are some things he talks about in there, and the thing that we made the mistake was not busy with him more about the farm, because that's one of the things well, I said, because we did busy with him about this place and the place down south. And I think he also tells a story in there that the, one time, he, his mother was was uh, she acted kind of as, as a midwife in that in the area also. Mm -hmm. And at one time, a couple of Indians came up there, and one of them's jaw was swollen up quite large. And she asked him something about it, or no, it's her jaw. The Indians came up, and that, and her jaw was swollen out like this. And she asked if they had a toothache, because generally when the Indians came by, well, if they had something, she'd give them a little something to eat. So they got along with it pretty good. And he reached a little bag that he had with him and gave her a piece of root and let her 
told her to chew this and put it on her tooth and you know pack it in that thing and she wasn't real sure about that but she did and it worked and, uh, and then he told them what the plant was and that plant grew wild around here what is uh, does he tell it on this? I don't remember uh, Jack uh, they had some of it planted right around the museum there may be some of it out in the back of it now because I don't think they destroyed all that land I recognize the plant when I see it but I don't know what it is it's got a real pretty purple flower in it but you dig it down, the root dries it out, and you can chew it up, and it's kind of a narcotic. But it oh. it, uh, it worked for that. Uh, when we were little kids, we always had some of that root in a little bo in a, in a little shelf there that's kept there. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it tastes like, because we used it too. Dad knew what it was, and, he, and we used it. And it was well, good. The Indians weren't so dumb. No, they knew the, uh, they, a lot of the things that they knew were their survival, sure. and it worked out very well for them. It was a... Good thing. Uh, grand, my grandmother came from Germany. She came right out of the old country oh. and uh, came up into Nebraska and then came on down here. In fact, I've always thought I'd like to go there and find that old place, but it's in East Germany. Did you and know it's her? It's a little bit mountain there. Oh, no, not really. Uh, I probably uh, I think she died when I was about two years old. Are there any so. stories of why they came over here from Germany? No. I, uh, th th there were. They were a pretty good sized family, those kids over there, and most of those girls came over here. And they settled up and around in the, in the Lincoln, Nebraska area. And uh, they, um, some of them, not, not any of them went back. They still, oh, they'd be back and forth. But I don't know. It seemed like it was just one of those surge and resettlements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And see, that would have been back in uh, 1890 or before. Yeah, there was a big surge. And, uh, yeah. It had been about that time, and she lived. They came from a little town above Hamburg, which is up in a little mountain area up in there, kind of close to the North Sea, up in that area. It, uh, but I don't know. I don't know anything. I never corresponded. Dad used to correspond with the family before World War II, but never since. So I don't know what I'm doing. Be a little dangerous to go over into East Germany now. I think this. I, they took the visa. Uh, requirement off of this little area, but I don't know anything more about it. Than that. We're gonna, okay. We've been Thank over you. there a time too. Okay, <laughs> this is August 29th, <coughs> 1985. This is Joe Todd and Bernice Jackson, an interview with Mr. Albert Ray Larison in Woodward, Oklahoma. Mr. Larison, right. where were you born? South Fargo on the uh, family homestead, yeah, on the homestead. I was born on the homestead. When's your birthday? September 3rd. Oh, eight was the year. Who was your father? Elmer Larison. And your mother? Was Della. What was her maiden name? Barrett. B A R R E T T? E or I, let me look. Spell that with an E or an I, Joe. Okay. Where were your parents from? North Missouri, Southern Iowa. Why did they come to Oklahoma? Uh, well, I'll tell you. <clears throat> Old Grandpa had uh, four boys and a son-in-law, and they just put near run out of something for all of them to do. And I, I really think that was about the, the main thing. And this uh, uncle, my dad's brother-in-law, and my dad were old enough to file. And there weren't any of the rest of them old enough. So now Grandpa didn't kick them out, but he said there's some new territory. So they, they came down here and filed on this open land. It's, I think, just as good a story as any that they just wasn't room for all of them there. That pretty near all of them were living in, I think. When did they come here? What year? 1900. 1900. Yeah. Okay. Now, I think Uncle John and Dad <clears throat> actually arrived in 1900, got located and everything, then went back and got the families. And uh, I would say it was 1901 when, when they actually had an address mm -hmm. down here. Were either of your grandfathers in the Civil War? 
my, no, no, some of my grand uncles were, mm -hmm. but neither one of my grandfathers. Yeah. Okay. And what kind of work did your father do? State farmers, all of them. The whole, whole family has been all the time. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Livestock and farming. As a small boy, what chores did you do in the farm? What time of day? <laughs> From sun up to sundown. We did it all, Joe. Yes, sure to work. Mm -hmm. Always had chores. I mean, always had hogs, uh, milking, bucket calves, uh, and horses in those days. My goodness. Somebody would go get the horses and bring them in, and, and you'd get the horses in the barn and feed and do the milking and all of that, then go back in for breakfast. Then come back and harness horses and such like. Mm -hmm. And we farmed with horses, of course, all the way up until, I guess we owned our first tractor probably in uh, about 22, 23. Did you ever help your father break out sod? Yeah, several different ways. How'd you break out sod? With, uh, generally, uh, we had two gang plows that took six horses each. And uh, anybody could could set on there and, and uh, see that those horses followed that furrow, you know, to go around and plow. And we just sure did. Broke out a lot of it. How many acres did you break out in one day? Oh, uh, it would be a pretty pretty good day if we'd get 15, 20 acres with both plows. Mm -hmm. What kind of house do you have on the homestead when you were a small boy? I was born in a in a, a shanty, what what they called the old uh, uh, homestead shanty. What they call it, Bernice? Uh, uh, and it wasn't Saudi, but it just uh, the shanty. And I'll tell you what it was. It was a straight up and down with a, with an attic that wasn't finished. Two rooms downstairs, two rooms upstairs, and a lean-to porch on the side. And we lived in that until, oh, I'd say, I think it was, we claimed about 1911 when Daddy built, when we built this new house. Okay, that's... I believe there's a picture of that there. With the standing out in front of it, wasn't there one there? Yeah, I saw one. I saw it did. Looks good. There it is. There it is. Hey, it. Yeah. Built that house, that's right. and this um, standing here. Okay, that's you, the small right. one on the end. Yeah. The youngest one then. I have uh, uh, two younger sisters mm -hmm. after that date. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I tell you something interesting about that sod, uh, Joe. Uh, when when Dad, other uh, settlers begin to leave and things, you know. Well, then here they would have a 40 or a 60-acre pasture that they hadn't broke out because they needed a, a pasture mm -hmm. and they needed something to farm. And we kept doing that clear up to the, to the 30s pretty near, just straight out. Be another family leave, and, and Dad would, would take it over either as a tenant or or buy it, and then we'd uh, have to break that pasture out, see. So it just actually did happen that way. We just kept kept doing it all the way through there. That World War II, uh, we, we were making money through there from about 20 to 26 or 7, see. And the more you could plow up and plant, by, uh, the more it would work. When did you get your first tractor? I would, I think 22. Be a good day. Though. What kind was it? No, John Deere bull tractor. Had uh, had. What's a bull tractor? All right. You know, they're, they're the only ones that made one like that. A lot of them even on the market then. But it had a one wheel drive, and it was a big wheel as wide as this table, and then a little land wheel over here that just helped support it, and then the front wheel was just one wheel, and you just guided. Your, your tractor with that one front wheel. And they would call it a, 
a bull tractor, and made by John Deere. Of course, I guess it's better than the horses. It would do more work than than that one six-horse team would mm -hmm. do. Right. Mm -hmm. What were the main crops you were raising back then? It was wheat and milo and broom corn. A lot of broom corn. <laughs> Tell me about pulling broom corn. I never pulled it. <laughs> uh, it was all hand, absolutely. You had to, had to pull it by hand. And uh, you'd, uh, did you ever see it grow? Do you know kind of what it is like? I've seen photographs of it, that's all. Joe, it comes up and tassels out that away, and that's what it is, just like a corn tassel, only a uh, lot more of it. And you had to catch the stalk here, and then you'd grab this uh, broom type uh, tassel and yank it down, see, and it would break off down here at the right place. Put that in your arm, when you got your arm full, and you'd lay it down in the row. And uh, it's all three or four in the same field, pretty near always. Now, I could drive the, the wagon that we picked that up with, see. Yep. So the wagons would be just uh, you know, a few hours or a half a day behind the pullers. And we'd go along then, pick that up, and put it on, the, on a flatbed wagon just like this, and haul it and stack it at the end of the roads. Where'd you sell the brim corn? Who bought it? Ingle Brothers and Shattuck. Uh, they had ha buying houses. From Lindsay to Shattuck, Oklahoma, and clear on into to Springfield, Colorado. Big, big uh, broom corn people. I understand Shattuck was the broom corn capital of the world at one time. They're just you, either Shattuck or Lindsay, you could just sure claim it. Mm -hmm. Just sure could. How many acres of broom corn did you have? Well, I remember one time, Joe, that. Uh, uh, had had a bad wheat crop. I don't remember it either hailed out or kind of died out through the winter. And uh, Dad planted 400 acres of broom corn. Oh, like you hired some help to pull that, didn't you? <laughs> what about wheat harvest? Because wheat harvest. Well, back in those days, it was about the same thing. It took everybody that you could hire. And uh, I drove a header, uh, I expect about 14 years old. And my several years before that, uh, I would drive the barge teams. Do you know how those barges and the headers work, Joe? Okay. What does the header do? And now the header uh, was just a plain sickle and platform with a canvas. And you'd clip the wheat off and had a reel lay it back on there, and that canvas would roll it down, and then there's what we just called the plain elevator. It had a double canvas. The top canvas run this way, backwards. The bottom canvas run the same direction, so that the two where they met would take this wheat right up to there and dump it over into a hay rack, header barge, we called it. And uh, he just had to cover every acre, just exactly like that. And then we'd make the center stacks, lay off the land to where uh, you could always have your barge full at the stack position. Mm -hmm. So horses didn't have to run back and forth across the field any more than possible, see. And you could go both ends. The header would go west, starting at the stack make a round, come back up, when he got back to the stack area again, he'd have a uh, swath through that land, and you'd trade barges there. That one would come into stack, another one would catch you there, and then you'd make the, the other end of that field, and you'd be full again when you got back to the stacks. Mm -hmm. Now, a kid, anywhere from seven or eight years old back in those days, would drive both barges. He, he'd ride the elevator, when, when he'd come in, before that barge was pulled out, he'd climb up on that elevator and sat up there until the other barge came under. And there'd just be one man in that barge, and, they, and the other boys would stay over there to help unload the stacks. You get that picture? And then that old kid would drive the barge for him, see? Now you just stack the wheat in the field? Yeah. At that center, we oh, if the wheat was pretty good, there'd be as many, uh, maybe six or eight stacks. 
How big are those stacks? Oh, measured by cubic feet or by bushels? <laughs> Probably cubic feet. I uh, hardly know how to describe them, but not big. Mm -hmm. Because when the trash machines would pull in and things like that, why? And you always left room. The trash machine, when he pulled in, he'd, he'd have a, a feeder type thing that would reach all the way the length of the stack. And you get on a stack on each side of it and pitch into that, and I'd roll that up into the thrashing machine proper. So. Who on the thrashing machine? Well, uh, they'd be about uh, three or four farmers somewhere that one of them would have one because you couldn't make too big a territory the way we were farming. I mean, a farmer with seven, eight, nine hundred acres of wheat, if you had uh, more than four or five in there, take too long. See? Mm -hmm. We never owned one, never, never owned a thrasher, but always had a neighbor that did, that lived within just a matter of a few miles. Mm -hmm. And how many hands on a harvest fruit? All right. It, uh, under today's uh, uh, employment program, <laughs> they had been twice as many as they were back in those days. Mm -hmm. But in those days, you had uh, you were supposed to have four in the barges and a stacker, which would be five, and then uh, the header man, and uh, then you always had what you kind of called a scratcher. He'd go around and assist the stacker by scraping down the side of his of his stack and gathering it up, pitch it up to him, and and, uh, and then he was a spare in case uh, somebody had to go get a drink of water too many times or something. Why well, he'd take their place. Yeah. So they'd be five, six. Now was that header? Was that? How many horses or mules did the header have? Six. Six on there and two on each barge. Now, sometimes we put four on those barges, but most of the time it's two to each barge. Now, do those horses push or pull that header? Well, we call it a push machine, but but they pull it from behind. Tell you what it was, Joe. Uh, the same, uh, just like any kind of a apparatus that way that was going to uh, clip or cut the, the wheat, just like the old binders and everything. But... Uh, They'd either have to be side draft, and those headers were built too big to put the horses out here like you did on the binder, see? So uh, your, uh, your team walked right behind the clipping sickle platform, and they pulled it with a long shaft that came through, and then that.